In the McGinnis lab, we're very interested in trying to understand viral host interactions specifically um, and how viruses reprogram the cell in order to support their infection and replication. So a little bit of background on the JC polyoma virus, because a lot of people aren't aware that the virus even exists, <laughs> is that it is a double-stranded DNA virus. It is not, excuse me, non-enveloped, and it has a capsid comprised of three viral proteins, so-called VP1, VP2, and VP3. VP1 is the only viral protein to be expressed on the exterior of the capsid and is directly um, recognized with viral binding to the host cell, which you can see is the little circles expressed on the exterior. They are pentamers and are um, copied 72 times on the exterior of the virus. Um, this virus is thought to infect nearly 50% of the population. However, it persists as a dormant infection within the kidney of healthy individuals, and during severe immunosuppression, the virus is able to migrate from the kidney into the central nervous system. Once in the central nervous system, it is responsible um, for a disease called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which we call PML. Um, and PML is noted by the destruction of oligodendrocytes within the brain, and these cells are specifically known for um, producing the myelin, which is responsible for normal brain function. Some symptoms of the disease include vision loss, and speech impediments, and sometimes can mimic um, multiple sclerosis depending on where it forms within the brain. It is highly associated with HIV and AIDS patients, as well as those receiving immuno. Um, modulatory therapies such as those who actually have MS, which is really sad. Um, the disease proves fatal within two years of symptom onset. Um, however, 90% of the patients um, end up succumbing to the disease as close as one year after symptom onset, so it's really high progressive. And in the figure on the right of the side, you can see all the way from pre-diagnosis all the way down subsequently through these MRI scans down to two and a half months after diagnosis. The white areas that you see within the brain are plaque formations from the death of these myelin producing cells. So as you can tell, as the name suggests, it occurs very quickly. And right now there's no effective therapy or treatment for either PML or this viral infection. However, because um, PML is so rare, it's very hard to diagnose, but um, as a result, we also know very little about the virus itself. What we do know is based off this working schematic that we have, and we know that the virus initially binds to alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid on LSTC receptors. We then know that at some point during the infectious cycle, the virus utilizes serotonin receptors um, in order to init initiate clathrin-mediated endocytosis, after which the virus is transported through early endosomes to the ER where it undergoes partial decoding. After this decoding, the virus is then again moved to the nucleus where the, um, it undergoes transcription and replication, and after which it is released from the cell through lytic processes. So the part that the McGinnis lab is most interested in the life cycle of this virus is the involvement of the serotonin receptors. We know that the serotonin receptors are utilized for internalization. However, we do not understand the specific mechanism of how they aid the virus's internalization. So in general, though, we do know a little bit about the serotonin receptor. It is a seven transmembrane spanning G-coupled receptor protein. And upon ligand binding, it is capable of activating phospholipase C. Phospholipase C, also known as PLC from here on out during this presentation, is responsible for the hydrolysis of PIP2 into IP3 and also DAG. IP3 then binds to its receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, eliciting a calcium flux within the cell. Now this calcium is known to activate various other um, subsequent signaling pathways one of which includes the further activation of a molecule called comodulin, which is capable of binding to two intracellular domains on the serotonin. This binding aids in stabilizing um, the receptor and increasing its expression on the exterior of the cell, theoretically aiding in further internalization of the virus. Another um, 
process that calcium is highly involved in is the activation of calcineurin. And calcineurin is known to dephosphorylate important transcript factors known as NFAT. And after dephosphorylation, these NFAT um, factors are able to migrate from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and aid in the viral transcription, which um, has previously been shown that if we knock down NFAT, we have absolutely no replication of the virus. So looking at the schematic, to me it appeared that calcium is a major regulator within JC infection. However, there's no real data or preliminary data even to examine this. So I started off by pretreating cells with a chemical called 2-APB. And 2-APB specifically inhibits IP3, IP3 from interacting with its IP3 receptors and therefore hindering uh, calcium flux within the cell and all subsequent pathways. So after this initial pretreatment, cells were infected with the virus and allowed to incubate post the initial infection and then quantified for positive VP1 expression within the nucleus, which as you'll remember earlier, VP1 is the protein that is responsible for actually binding the virus to the cell. And now you can see on the right of the side is the data from this experiment. And as you can see, as we increase the concentration of 2-APP, we see a severe inhibition of JC um, ability to replicate VP1 within the nucleus. So off from this data, it appears that calcium is in fact required for viral replication. However, part of me was wondering how specific are these results to APB specifically? Are these purely results based off of 2 APB specific chemical properties or can I recreate these using the inhibition of a different part of the signaling pathways? So the next part that I tried was to use an inhibitor called U73122 and this inhibitor deactivates PLC from hydrolyzing PIP2. Therefore, any subsequent pathways are um, incapable of occurring and therefore we limit or actually hinder calcium flux. And again, we see a significant decrease in infection. Um, so this goes to tell us that calcium is actually required for viral infection. But as you'll remember, it appears that calcium affects many different parts of the virus's not only um, entry but also replication. And I wanted to try to understand which part of the virus's life cycle is actually being affected. So I decided to start at the very beginning with viral attachment. And in order to do this, I again pretreated my cells with 2-APB and then incubated them at 4 degrees with fluorescently labeled virus. This virus whether bound or unab being unable to bound due to treatments was then analyzed by flow cytometry. The results, which you can now see on this histogram, um, the gray bar represents my untreated cells, the blue represents my control, and then the green represents my 2-APB treated cells. And as you can tell between the control and my 2-APB pretreated cells, there's little to no distinguishable difference between the virus's ability to attach. So therefore, suggesting attachment is not um, the process in the life cycle that's being hindered. So my next part to examine was viral internalization. Now this part could have been a little tricky because as you can see, we're actually including three different steps within this examination. So we could be affecting serotonin expression, we could be affecting the ability of the, virus to, of the virus to internalize because papers have shown that calcium is actually required for um, clathrin activation and has also been shown that calcium is also required for successful um, transport of the virus in endosomes. So there are a few different things that be, could be affected by this. However, in order to actually distinguish the difference between virus that was attached and internalized, I use a method called tripan blue quenching assays. And in order for this to work, I again pretreated my cells with 2-APV and um, incubated the cells with fluorescently labeled virus again. After this incubation, I treated the cells with tripan blue. And how this will work is after the um, being treated, any fluorescent on the exterior of the um, cell will in fact be blocked. So any fluorescence will not be able to be picked up by the flow cytometer 
And this is what we use the terms that, um, as quench. The next part was I also incubated cells with fluorescently labeled virus at 37 degrees in order to mediate entry of the virus into the cell. And this time, when we add tripan blue, any virus that's on the inside will still be able to fluoresce. And this gives us the term of protected fluorescence. So this is how I distinguish the difference between binding and actual internalization. And here are the results. So I'm going to break this down just a little bit for you. So these far two bars are my control and two APB at four degrees. So this is the viral attachment. And as you can see, we have very low percent protected fluorescence, which is what we expected as well as very little difference between the two bars, further suggesting that viral attachment is not being affected. The next two bars, again, are the control into AVB, but this time at the 37 degrees incubation. As you can tell, we have a much higher protected fluorescence, and again, there's still no significant difference between the two APB and control-treated um, cells, suggesting that none of the steps for internalization are also being affected. So this kind of leaves us with the question of, so what is actually going on? Because right now, we're just kind of standing here, and I haven't had time to really continue this ex these experiments out. Um, but this is what brings me to the conclusions that calcium flux media, specifically by the IP3 and IP3 receptor interactions, is required for JC infection that the inhibition of the calcium flux has no effect on attachment or internalization. So for future um, experiments, I would really like to look at to see um, if the reduction of activated calcineurin and therefore the reduction of NFAT migration to the nucleus has any role in the virus's incapability to bind with this reduction of calcium flux. And with that, I would like to thank my professor, um, Dr. Melissa McGinnis, for giving me the opportunity to work with her this summer. I would also like to extend um, a thank you to everybody in our lab, and specifically Jeannie Duchesne, um, who is our, one of our PhD students and um, so kindly prepared the fluorescinated virus for me, as well as one of our other summer interns, um, Trevor Lyford from Brown University, for helping me to stay in some place so I can get some <laughs> last minute data in, as well as the Inbury Summer Internship, which allowed me to come and present to you all today, as well as the IDEA grant, which funds the McGinnis Lab year-round, and some additional um, external funding from the Frederick Radke Undergraduate Research Fellowship, as well as the University of Maine Honors College and um, MDI Biological Laboratories for hosting the symposium and allowing me for to come and talk to you all today. And with that, I will take your questions. Questions for Ashley? Yes. Well, I'm curious. Um, you, it seemed like you said that 2 APB inhibited IP3, mm -hmm. and therefore calcium efflux. Yeah. That function. Um, so that sounded like a good mechanism, but then when you tried it later, it seemed like that, that because it, you weren't sure about how it wasn't impacting the cell surface and internalization of the mm -hmm. virus, that now you didn't understand how 2-APB was working. Is it, is it affecting IP? So, we, so as far as we know that 2-APB um, specifically inhibits IP3 by binding specifically to the IP3 receptor. So in that sense, we know how 2-APV hinders the calcium flux. What we are unclear of is specifically how that interaction between the IP3 and IP3 receptors in reducing the calcium flux further um, inhibits the viral infection. So that's why I was so interested to try to understand which part of the life cycle is this flux actually affecting. One more question? You have shown on one of your slides that the interaction with cadmium. Yeah. Uh, this might be a step because uh, this is also a calcium uh, <coughs> association. Mm -hmm. So do you know which association there is between cadmium and uh, the virus when it's taken up? Um, I do not know. The only reason why caviolin was not included in the internalization and the quenching assay that I ran is because during the incubation periods. Um, while caviolin 
appears to be linked with the actual internalization. It is more so linked with the transportation of the virus to the actual nucleus. So because the time points that I used in order for the quenching assay, the caviolin transport was not included during that time point of the virus. Um, however, I have not had time to look at anything regarding the caviolin, and I um, think that that would be an interesting question, though, to try to look into more in the future. One more question. So uh, the initial drug you showed us mm -hmm. quite a job of protection, pretty in the home front, where the 2 a the only had a much smaller reduction. Right. So, so could it be that that was mucking up your results in terms of trying to find this difference? So it was, it, I think it was with the 2EPB that we did see the significant inhibition of the of infection. Are you talking about between like the PLC inhibitor and then the IP3? Right. So one theory that I did come across with that, which I haven't been able to actually observe yet, is that by inactivating PLC, um, it's still we're not really sure of how fast acting this inhibitor is for one. So we're not really sure if, or initially, like how long the effect actually able to last within the cell. So one thing that I was thinking was that, one, there's already a surplus of IP3 receptors within the cell that the virus can signal to already just go and bind anyways, as we are not affecting its ability to bind to the receptor. But additionally, um, like I said before, there are, we're not sure how effective the actual inhibitor is because we haven't been able to do that. But so theoretically, some PLC could have already hydrolyzed PIP2 into IP3, um, which allows for some calcium flux, but not as much as if we had left the PLC uninhibited. Okay. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please do uh, ask Ashley your questions afterwards. I think I'd like to thank Ashley. Thank you.